Okay, so I'm going to give you guys parametric velocity, acceleration, and jerk. Yeah. So my claim is you already know how to do this, you just don't know you know. So recall from, I don't know, somewhere? Okay. Recall from somewhere that P of t is often the thing you start with. P of t being position, right? Guys good with this? Okay. So, if position is the top of the ladder, if you take a ddt of position, what do you get? You get a velocity, right? Okay, and then you take a ddt again, what do you get? Acceleration. acceleration. Then if you take a DDT again, you get jerk. And if you take a DDT again, if you take a DDT again, you get the rate of change of jerk. <laughs> right? Okay. Most people stop trying this thing at acceleration, right? Yeah. But we were we were talking about spaceships the other day and jerk comes into play a little bit. Yeah, that's great. So <laughs> this stuff's going to be exactly the same in our new land where we do this. So the only thing oh. I'm doing is I'm changing P of T from a one dimensional position function, which does crap like height, right? or the x-coordinate, or the y-coordinate, right? I would really like to do, like, I don't know, ballistic missiles with this crap. And that doesn't do a good job with ballistic missiles, right? Because that only gives you one variable. The missile moves in three dimensions, right? OK, so I would like to know where the missile is in three dimensions. Hence, I have three-dimensional position. You all good with this? Okay, so I am thinking of this thing as a x of t, y of t, z of t vector, right? Right? Yes? Is a vector with three component functions? Okay, wild guess, how do you get v of t? Oh, gra gradient? Yeah. No. I don't know. Does a gradient make sense? Oh, no, because that's a, <laughs> it's a vector, not a function. Never mind. Yeah, so a gradient's a vector that you make out of a yeah. scalar function, right? Yeah. OK. So this is like the other way, right? This is a function from R into R3. And I want to talk about the derivative, right? Like, Somehow I want to do this. Like I want to hit this sucker with a ddt, right? It only depends on one variable, so it is a hard derivative. You guys see that? Like it's not a partial derivative. Is it as simple as taking the derivative of each of the components? Yeah, just it, maybe it should yeah. be. Let's. I was yeah. Say, is it x of t a function? Or is it just yeah, x of t is a function. So maybe we could think to ourselves, right? We just do x prime of t, comma y prime of t comma z prime of t, right? OK, that seems like a good idea. Let me show you that that's actually what you should get. Okay. So if we're going to do dp dt, right? the way we would do this is we would take a limit as Delta t goes to zero, right? Yep. Oh, gosh. Uh, what? Was it like p? Uh, Should be yeah, p yeah. of t plus delta t. Yep. Minus p of t. Minus p of t, t all over delta t. Delta t, right? Okay. Let me ask if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. T is a scalar, right? What's delta t going to be? 
technically a, like it's a scalar that's approaching zero. Yeah, it's going to be a scalar that you said to zero. Okay, I can add scalars together. Yep. Cool. Uh, P is a vector value function now, right? Mm -hmm. So this business here is a vector. It's a vector, right? Or it's a vector function of a scalar. Uh, what's this guy? Dmt. And vector. That was the original position. That's a vector two, right? So this whole business together is. Yeah, that's a displacement vector, right? Or just a difference between two vectors. So you've got a vector and you're dividing by a scalar. Can you do that? Yeah, you just multiply by one over the scalar, right? Scalar multiplication. No, oh, crazy. I haven't written down anything nuts, so maybe it works. Let's try it. So I've got the limit change in t going to zero of, let's see, in the first slot, right, I'm going to get x of t plus delta t minus x of t all over delta t. Are you guys with me on that? Yes. And then I'll get comma y of t plus delta t minus y of t all over delta t. And in my last slot, I'll have z of t plus delta t minus z of t all over delta t. OK. And then maybe magic would allow me to bring the limit in there. And then I would get this, right? That last step's kind of magic, <laughs> right? Because I'm distributing a limit into oh. a vector, like it's scalar multiplication. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. I don't know how or why to do that, but we'll just go with it. I think it's because the limit is kind of assumed in the scalar, but I... Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. But I'm kind of telling you that that's a little bit more complicated. Okay, I'll just... We'll let it go at, you can do this. Okay. You should be skeptical when people pull magic tricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so at any rate, it seems like at the very least I ought to get x prime, y prime, z prime, right? Yep. And certainly if there was any justice in the world, which usually there isn't, I would get that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you do get that. There is some justice. This is one of the few cases where there's justice in the world. If you do DDT again to this thing, double what will you get? Double prime? Yeah, you'll get double primes, right? You'll get an A of T, which is given by X double prime, Y double prime, and Z double prime. And I dropped my of T's there, but put them in. And then if you do this again, you get jerks and triple primes, right? Okay, so my, my question is, what is the difference? Why is this preferable? Why is this important? Yeah, like, what's the, what's the improvement? Because this seems like calc 1 again, right? Um, well, this can go in any direction simultaneously. It's just you're providing it one time input. But in Calc 1, you only have one direction. Does this mean to an extent we're doing, we're applying the derivatives? I know we are doing derivatives to a function, but we're applying it to more than functions, I guess. But Yeah, basically, this is just me keeping track of a bunch of one dimensional functions all at the same time, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. You guys see that? That's really the justification for pulling that limit in there. It's like, well, these aren't tangled up at all. Like, this is a one-dimensional function. When you send t prime to zero for that one-dimensional function, this stuff doesn't matter. Right? Because this stuff doesn't have anything to do with that. That's just a piece of information in there. Those are extra information, right? And they tell you something, but they don't make x change. Okay, so that the only thing that x depends on is that t value. 
Cool. So what does this do? Well, this lets you stick more information into kind of a better array. Like, it's just a tool for information storage, right? Okay. But now I can think of, instead of what's the velocity and thinking, oh, well, that's how fast it's going, right? This velocity now contains really obviously direction information. Mm -hmm. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're going 1,000 miles per hour straight up, you're not going very fast forward. Yeah, exactly. Right. You can resolve this into components and get some interesting information out of that. If you want to go back to how fast was I going, right? Good, perfect. That's the magnitude of the vector, right? So if you want to know speed, that's magnitude of b. You guys good with that? How do you calculate the magnitude of the v vector? I mean, that's the square root of volume squared. Yeah, square sum the components, right? And then square root. Cool? All right, I think I have... Well, maybe I don't have time to do that thing. It's cool, though. All right, let's, let's ask the obvious question. Yesterday, I gave you an example of a, of a login, right? Yep. OK. Oh, is that why this is? So here's a line. Let's just pick a random line. We'll go t plus 2 comma 2t minus 3 comma 3t plus 7. Right, here's some random line. What's the velocity function for this thing? So if you do L prime of t, what do you get? You just get the components, right? It's a constant value. 1, 2, 3. Which is the what of that line? The direction the directional vector, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of the direction of the line, right? Which if I thought about that thing in kind of mx plus b form, right? I would think about that as the vector 1, 2, 3 times t plus the vector 2, negative 3, 7. Right? So when you differentiate, you got the slope. Cool. That's good. It agrees with my usual, right? Okay, here's another example. I'll give you a function c of t. c of t is going to be cosine t sine t uh, t. <clears throat> that's a good one. Is that a line? I think that's, that's the c of uh, t stands for a circle. Yeah. yeah, the c kind of stands for a circle. This, this is not actually a circle. It's not, it's a it's a helix. It's a circle. Yeah, so if you take a derivative, right, you get, oops, let me call that c prime of t. What do you get? Oh, negative sine t. Yeah, it's negative sine t. Negative sine t, cos t, and 1. If you take c double prime, right, if you look at the acceleration, what do you get? Negative cosine t, negative sine t, 0. Oh, so it's like a spiraling. Okay, so if I think about having cosine t and sine t, right? As I change t, those are spiraling around, right? So if this was in the xy plane, those would just be circle around the unit circle. Start at 0, 1, right? Oh, you start at, I screwed this up. Oh, well. Start at 1, 0. Not the thing I said. This is, by the way, the usual parameterization. So if I start at 1, 0, right? That's out here. And then we're going to go, well, let's see, which direction does my velocity vector point in? Oh, 
Oh, good. It points up really consistently, right? The velocity is always the same going up, which is why your acceleration upward is zero. Right? It's constantly going up, which means you're slinky here. Yes. Your slinky does not look like it does up here, right, where the rings are compressing. It looks more like it does in the middle for their uniform distance apart, right? You guys all see that? So, slinky. And then, there's something a little bit special about this. If you disregard the Z coordinates there, like if I change this thing to read zero, it would just and zero, right? What's special about C of T dotted with C prime of T? Dotted? Um, oh. You guys see that that makes sense? But they're vectors, so I can dot product them. What do you get? One, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> what's the special value for dot products? Like, what's the thing that makes dot products interesting? They give you a scalar, right? What does that scalar mean? Dot product's interesting when the scalar value you get out of it is zero, which is when they're perpendicular. You get negative sine t times cosine t plus cosine t times sine t. You get zero out of this. That means the position vector for circling around in the xy plane, right? So I'm talking about this thing, which lives just in the xy plane. And the velocity vector? Well, the velocity vector looks like this, right? These are kind of flat on there, right? Those are in the xy plane, because their z component zero. But what the heck is this thing with dot product zero? What's perpendicular there? Means that the velocity vector is perpendicular to the circle that's traced by that function. So so close. The velocity vector is perpendicular to the vector that points from the origin out to that curve, right? Yeah. So it always points out. This was that thing we discovered earlier today, right? About the radius of a circle is always perpendicular to a tangent line. Oh. Uh, that's why. Well, at least this is an example of why. There's a thing you can do where you set the magnitude of a curve squared as a constant. You can write the magnitude squared as c of t times c of t, right? That's some constant. You can differentiate both sides. You can see this with the product rule. Try that. It's fun. Cool? Okay.